Glad you're here tonight. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, what in the world do anxiety, poop, brain science, and scripture have to do with one another? Well, did you guys hear about the giant pile of poop in Dallas, downtown Dallas? Did y'all hear about that? Well, there was a big let that go, let that stuff go campaign. Yeah, and the little doggy says, did I do that? You know? Um, this was from uh, Poo Pourri. This is a bit edgy, but sorry about that. But uh, Poo Pourri is a uh, uh, spray before you go uh, product for the bathroom odor issue that many people might be anxious about. And this was going to be a transformative experience uh, about your stuff. So let's move on from that. Um, I think they were really on to something here. Uh, flush those thoughts that sabotage and rid yourself of the toxic. That's what was going on here. If you were brave enough to go into the 30-foot blow-up thing of poop, then you would see stuff like, I'm too young, and messages like negativity, and regret, and I'm not good enough, inadequacy, things like that. <clears throat> well, you know, that's good for starters. We gotta have some awareness of what's going on, don't we? And anxiety is a humongous problem, especially among students. We're going to talk a little bit about how much it is. But uh, yeah, they're on to something, and we do need to let that stuff go. But our awareness campaign's enough. Well, let's talk about that. Or you could be somebody who's been victimized by uh, a religious legalist, you know. <laughs> I wish I could have downloaded the, uh, uh, it, it just keeps beating her. You should know better than that. Come on. So anyway, you may have been victimized by that. Well, young generations are stressed and anxious. A lot of people are. Uh, as I meet students, I see a trend. And in some populations, there's a guarantee that stress-induced anxiety and depression are life-shaping. Um, Shame-based cultures without categories for this. Uh, are especially prone, I've talked with a lot of my Indian friends and they say their parents don't have a category for that and it's a stigma. It's a stigma here a lot. It's a stigma around the world. And you know, we get inputs from ourselves and the outside world as well as our inner lives, like I said. So we're hearing reports in the news about millennials getting really anxious about having kids. In fact, they're foregoing families because of things like fear for the environment, climate change. So people are not getting married, not having kids. The Barna Group, who studies evangelicals and Christians, found trends of anxiety about the future among a young generation that came of age during the housing crisis. So people were losing their homes when they were kids, and they didn't understand. That's very hard. I had one incident where I came home from track practice one time, and my father and mother were standing outside and the sheriff's deputies were putting all our stuff out on the, any piece of grass they could find in the apartment building. Oh my goodness. That was a shaker to the core. And at that point, I had been deciding to give my life fully to Jesus Christ. I'd already believed in him, and I'd kind of lived a double life. And at that point, I said, you know, this is the jumping off point. This is where you either trust or you don't. And it was really cool to see the decision to do that in the moment. Change. I saw a change come over the faces of my parents as I told them that it was going to be okay. God was going to have this. God's got this. And so that was a seminal moment in my life. So that is a real concern for the future. A lot of people are, are concerned about debt. Anybody here going to have some debt when you get out of college? A lot of people. Uh, some of you are so smart you're on uh, full scholarships. So uh, help out your friends. <laughs> Well, I checked with the UTD um, Counseling Center, and wonderful operation out here. Some friends have been helped there. Um, she said that about 70% of the people presenting with their symptoms there, it's about stress and anxiety and depression, which is very related. And she said the symptoms around these can vary. However, they are often exacerbated by stress of school, feelings of loneliness and relationships, identity exploration, Stress overall with the pressures of college life. Okay, so that's a trend that you see nationwide. She lent me some, she sent me some research. Well, look here. This is from the Center for Collegiate Mental Health annual report for last year, 2018. 
So you see that the, uh, this is check all that apply on the survey they took with students during this year, these years. They compiled it and said anxiety, stress, and family down here. Always family in there somewhere. Depression, stress, and anxiety are tops of the problems. He even said that suicide, even though, thank God, it's a minority, less than 10% of the people uh, had committed it or were involved in it. It still said the self-reported lifetime prevalence of rates of threat to self characteristics, non-suicidal self-injury, uh, serious suicidal ideation, thinking about suicide, and suicide attempts had increased for the eighth year in a row among students receiving counseling services. Um, thank goodness that that was, again, only under 10% of the people, but still that's a pervasive problem. So then you see that the top concerns, that's a different measure, anxiety and depression. So that's nationwide. So UTD trends are following nationwide trends for students. Here we see the different things that are involved in some of the stresses. Generalized anxiety, social anxiety, panic attacks, unspecified test taking. I thought that would be higher, but that's what's involved in that top line. But look how much further that is, how much higher the incidence there as the top concern. By far and away, it's anxiety and depression, even though these problems are very real. Well, there's actually a movement in Nigeria to take away the stigma. Uh, mental health has no category for many of the generations that have gone before in a certain culture. So I really appreciated this testimony of Victor Ugo. He was the founder of this movement. And he said, we don't need, need awareness. We need mental health literacy. We need to educate people. And so I agree with that. He was a med student in university, major depressive disorder, and he had people come around him to help him. So that was an incredible blessing for him. He said, if I could go through this, then what about everyone else who didn't have the same access that I had? So it's a social concern, too. And you know, even smartphones, you know, a lot of ink has been spilled, a lot of digits have been posted about what we go through and the stresses of social media and smartphones. But did you know that there was a UT study recently, the mere availability of the smartphone diminished intellectual performance and attentiveness, just having it within 10 feet. When I was doing this talk, I tried to get my phone at least 10 or 11 feet away. And I'm not one who jumps at every ding, but it really does have an effect. It wasn't just that they were getting notifications, it was the very presence of it, even if the phones were off. So these little rockets in our pocket are really changing our lives. So it's not just an attentiveness issue, it's the fact that it's kind of taken over our psyches. Well, there is a student who I've asked to come and share her story. And she's standing right over here. Boyun, come on up. Boyun Sol is uh, uh, a member of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. She needs to move on to that great group. But uh, Boyun, would you share with us what you shared with uh, some of the folks in InterVarsity? Sure, absolutely. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Boyi. I'm the vice president of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. I'll just pull this here. Oh, all mm -hmm. right. Um, yeah, so I guess I was asked to share my story on anxiety today. And um, my experience with anxiety has been um, for a large portion of my life. Um, and it's looked really different before I came to Christ about two years ago and afterwards. Um, so I think like with anxiety, I'm, I'm talking about like, I guess, generalized anxiety and not really like panic attacks and things like that. But I think a source of my anxiety before I became Christian, and also like during my Christian years is that um, it comes from a lack of security, I guess, and trying to find my worth in like things other than God, I suppose. And um, I always found myself like trying to find fulfillment and um, I guess purpose in like other things like uh, relationships or through my career or my success and everything was just um, very unstable, I guess. And then I come to Chris I become Christian and 
I guess it still looks the same, but the way that I, le I alleviate anxiety is very different. Because I think that in Christianity, um, God is a peace giver, and he has a peace that uh, he gives to us, and all we have to do is accept it. And I guess um, before Christianity, it was something that I constantly felt like I had to pursue and that I had to chase after. Um, but with my years in Christianity, I've really been able to accept the peace that God has already given me. And the peace I feel is very different because it does say in the Bible, like, um, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying, like, um, I give you peace, but not as the world gives. And I've felt a big difference in how I battle my anxiety and how I'm challenged to um, believe more and to have more faith uh, to really receive that peace from God. And I know that might be a bit confusing <laughs> if you're not Christian, so I'm sorry about that, but um, I can totally explain more. Um, I don't want to talk for too long, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Boyan. I appreciate that. And you know what? You dealt with um, something that you shared with the uh, university crowd somewhere. Would you like to tell just briefly uh, uh, that, okay. that story, or do you want to? Yeah, I can share about mm -hmm. that. Um, so what I shared in university was um, lonely, uh, mainly about like a drug addiction that I developed um, out of my insecurity, I guess. Um, there was just, it was about two years ago, and it's the main reason that I became Christian. It was because I'd reached such a low in my life after dealing with depression and suicide attempts, um, hospitalizations and anxiety and all of that. Um, I was just really put down to my knees because of the drug addiction I developed uh, in college and um, that's when I really decided to follow Jesus because I was reading this book and I was talking about the gospel, the story of how Jesus came down, saved our sins and whatever. Um, but it was a lot personalized because it's actually uh, the book Reason for God by Timothy Keller. But um, I was reading it and I guess he was saying that Jesus gives you a hope that there is hope, <laughs> that there is um, a way to, I guess, live a more fulfilling life and a life without anxiety, and or not exactly without that anxiety, but that there was potential for me to be freed by a lot of chains that I built up um, from my mental health issues. And so that's when, um, I guess, I accepted Jesus. And with that, I also accepted peace and the potential of peace that there was a way that I could pursue hope in my life for once. And that was really, that would have been impossible <laughs> if it wasn't for God. Mm. And I'm so grateful for all the ways that have been changed and the fact that I get to share this with y'all too. And I know <laughs> you guys probably don't know me, so this might be weird, you're hearing a lot, but <laughs> thank no, you for listening. Good. Yeah. Very good, really appreciate that. Appreciate the chair. <laughs> and thank you for opening up like that. I appreciate that. And your work now, you know, Boyan uh, reaches out and does a study called? Oh, Revelations. Revelations. And you know what? I wish we had more time to talk about it, but come back and we'll have her tell more about it. But some of us have spoken there, and she's opened up her life and her faith to the campus. So thank you so much, Boyan, for sharing. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, is it okay? Thanks. Yeah, it's fine. Be anxious for nothing. You can, you can leave with our blessing, but thank you. So there's a real story of someone who has placed their trust in something beyond life hacks. And as we'll see later, what if there is more than a life hack and maybe life without lack? Of course, as she said, anxiety is going to be a part of this life on, our, on earth no matter what. But she spoke of having resources. Let's talk about that some more. So where is the hope? She spoke of hope. And she kind of slipped and said something profound. Hope about hope. Hope about having hope. And you know, a lot of us are anxious about being anxious and depressed about being depressed. So I think that makes sense. Well, Dr. J.P. Moreland, who wrote this book, Finding Quiet, My Story of Overcoming Anxiety and the Practices That Brought Peace, said this, well, this is not just some slouch, this is not some uh, punk kid, although I'm not calling any of the students here a punk kid. <laughs> he is one of the top 50 most influential uh, philosophers of our time, according to Best Schools magazine. 
and I would think that it would be higher than that. I first learned philosophy under this gentleman, and I, it blew my mind. But he is also someone who loves God, but was really stuck in some panic attacks. So he says that anxiety dries up the bones, that's a quote from scripture, rather than farther than a marathon run in August through Death Valley. If you try to fix anxiety head on, you can, it can drain you of energy and make you listless. And perhaps the worst thing about anxiety is getting anxious about getting anxious and losing hope that things will ever be different. I've been there and I never want to go back, he says. After years of therapy, medication, and disciplined practices, including psychological and spiritual habits he does daily that he writes about in his book, uh, Moreland has seen a total breakthrough. All his life, he anxiously lived in the future. Um, now he plans his week provisionally on a Sunday and takes one day at a time. His wife asks him, what are you going to do this week? He says, honey, honestly, I don't know. So he just lives it. There is a way to a thriving life. That's why he wrote the book. Well, um, as Boyun mentioned, Scripture promises more. It promises more than just some peace for a time. The name of the Lord is a strong fortress, and the godly run into it and are safe. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication or petition with thanksgiving. Now, that's something we're coming back to. Seems stuck in there, doesn't it? It's not. Present your requests to God. Pray. Ask for things. And the peace of God, which really is kind of ridiculous, it passes all common sense understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And notice the hearts and minds. That's Philippians. I'm leaving you with a gift. This is what she mentioned. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is the gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. If there's anything that you hear Jesus saying in the Gospels repeatedly is fear not. And the God of the Old Testament, his father, the same God of the New Testament, by the way, says, I'm with you multiple hundreds of times. So that's, you can do your own field research about that. And that testimony was a, a, an invitation into doing that. So uh, I can tell you as someone who has been exploring that faith for over 45 years, it works. But it doesn't just work, it's a relationship. Let's talk about that a bit more. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, what is that? That's a decision-based, really an evidence-based thing. And Dr. Caroline Leaf, an audiologist, communications pathologist and cognitive researcher who has written a really incredible book, Switch on Your Brain, The Key to Peak Happiness in Thinking and Health. I see some smiles in the audience. Has written something that marries science, which she is expert at, and she's good at researching the research, and also the scripture. So, Science is a way for God to show us that we're part of him and we follow his laws, we reap the benefit. Hmm. So commands may not just be something for a totalitarian deity to tell us to do. Hmm. And her emphasis is, as an individual, you're capable of making mental change in your life, emotional change, bodily change, down to the DNA level. We'll talk more about that too. So this gives you knowledge, it changes your life. And on neurogenesis, which is also called neuroplasticity, the changeable mind, what a remarkable and hopeful portrait of the endless adaptivity of the human brain God has given us. Hmm. So what about the cognitive research? Well, it is showing us that we can control our own mental health. In fact, we had a real interesting discussion. Brian and I discussed with somebody who's exploring in this group, exploring Christianity, wants to be a Christian, but can't quite get there not yet, about uh, determinism, whether or not we are de predetermined bodily, physically, uh, or his concern was, I think, I interpret correctly, being predetermined by God to either believe or not. So that's going to be a theme here. Well, by and large, the claim here is that we determine our own experience in life. We control so little out there, but our entire experience of all that is contingent on our reaction to and our processing 
of inner beliefs about the world, events, people, and the cosmos, and God. We decide. And let me make this statement as a firm belief. God is scandalously committed to our human free will. We don't really want to believe how much. <coughs> Science is increasingly bearing this out. We can see in real time how our thinking and feeling changes the very structure of our brains. So the old mind-brain debate may be being rendered moot. Stay tuned. Well, Moreland weaves research in his testimonial and offers steps he used to conquer a lifetime of anxiety and panic attacks, as I mentioned. These are disciplines that involve the heart and the mind. And I recommend his book highly for that. Well, this Stoic was right about it. Hence, for him, the discipline, discipline was the highest order of good. But this is a scriptural thought it happens to be. So this comports with Proverbs which says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now notice that, thinks in his heart, let's come back to that. So just a few decades ago, the standard operating thesis in science was that fixed brain was what we had. We had a hardwired machine and brain damage, aging, all of those kinds of events here, traumatic brain injury, stroke, PTSD, all you were to do, I think I, I, think I dyslexified that, that's my brain. <laughs> that's supposed to be PTSD. All of those were supposed to be handled through compensation. Okay, we'll just try to make do with what we have. But brain research has come a long way. And now we know that there have been huge advances in restoring capacity, not for settling what with, what's going on there. It's almost as if the self-healing was built into our bodies. Interesting. Dr. Leaf's patients did some awesome things. It's incredible to read about what's going on there. It all starts in the realm of the mind with our ability to think and choose the most powerful thing in the universe after God, and indeed fashioned after God, says Leaf. Well, she's not just a Christian talking about a, a devotional thing from her private life. After working with kids in the slums of Soweto, South Africa. She was working with some uneducated, impoverished kids who were crammed into little classrooms and did not even have enough uh, training. They didn't advance in school. She came along and did some experiments. She tutored them. She put her practices to practice with them. And they came alive cognitively, attitudinally, and emotionally. Before they couldn't advance, after they were made, they made it to the Ministry of Education's most improved list. They just needed training. They also needed motivation. It's intriguing. Research of the Soweto students compared to Harvard students. Okay, so four to five Harvard students were non-functional due to depression. We have a Harvard grad here. And I hope that wasn't you, but it might have been. I've dealt with depression myself. But um, Four to five, non-functional at Harvard. But 95% of the Soweto slum students said they loved schoolwork and learning. They wanted to change, so they chose to. They didn't settle and stay stuck. This follows after the scripture, scripture directly. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If I were reading that as a non-Christian, I'd say, wow, it even makes that claim? What is this all about? You can be renewed? Interesting. So determinism, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, is wrong and is being overturned by science, according to this cognitive researcher, Dr. Leaf. From the moment God created us with free will, we entered into the realm of creative responsibility for our own choices. As we were talking after the meeting that time with this individual I mentioned, I said, you know, did you notice that you keep saying, you keep choosing to say that Everything's predetermined. And he went back to, well, what if I'm determined to say that? And I said, well, we're at an impasse, aren't we? You can always say that, and I can always say this. But let's look at the evidences here. And I hope he gets to see that. Could the implications be too much for people? Well, I couldn't get hold of Dr. Leaf, and I couldn't get hold of her graphics online. And I feel good about this ethically because this is not for profit and this is 
my silly little photo of the book. But you can see that we are a complex being. Our brains are incredibly complex, our senses. And you know, even in Hebrew thought, we, our will is centered in the gut. But then you see this little emotional black hole. Well, that might bring to mind the poop, you know? So let's keep tying these things together. Again, poop, brain science, scripture, what? Well, some of the neuroplasticity success stories um, from Dr. Lee's research. And you know, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, look at that, but let me mention a few of them. The capacity of the brain to be changed by its own inner, its owner, intentionally using the mind for restructuring. That's what's going on with neuroplasticity. You are your own neuroplastic surgeon. Wow. Autistic kids were able to cope in all kinds of environments. Oldsters were able to change careers, earn degrees. I felt good about earning a master's in the 50s. It's about all I could do. And we've got one gentleman here getting a doctorate. Raise your hand, Rick. In his 60s. Yeah, way to go, man. And not that there's any relationship, but vegetables, people who are said to be vegetables, accident victims who were written off by neurologists were able to retrain their brains. It's an amazing, adaptable thing, the human brain. Wow. Learning disabled students were able to master things. Suicide, which we mentioned, suicidal and emotionally traumatized minds have been set free. And entire schools improved the grades. For everything there's a season, a time to break down and a time to build up. Ecclesiastes. Hmm. We break down thoughts, we build up new thoughts. Much more on that to come. Neuroplasticity or the brain's ability to reorganize and change itself through a person's lifetime is a truly remarkable thing. This is the, uh, the healthy.com website. One study by the University of Montreal published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences 2011 compared the brain activity of in individuals who were born blind and those who had normal vision. They found that the part of the brain that's normally wired to work with our eyes can instead rewire itself to process sound information instead of visual perception. Interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. The brain is always learning how to learn, always changing. <clears throat> Your brain networks form an inner life of the brain. They're flexible. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's an anti-correlation. We can switch between various networks constantly pillars inside your brain, and control centers, hemispheres, bundles of nerves, the amygdala, all these kinds of things. This enables us to control the controllable, our reactions to events and circumstances, and to capture our thoughts. Kids will only be so controllable, but in a safe room can be directed. Anybody who's done childcare knows this, <laughs> except maybe it didn't work, but uh, they can't be completely controlled, can they? but we can learn to control them. And rogue children can be corralled. God has designed our brain to work for us and not to control us, says Dr. Leaf. Science is never settled. If you hear that, for example, well, we won't go there, but you hear certain things in the headlines, the science is settled. Well, that is not proper science. Science is never to be settled. Science, scientists, Decide things, not science, first of all. And they should always be looking to counter, off, counter their own theses, their hypotheses. Well, we're learning through brain imaging techniques, behavioral changes, the evidence of that. We can measure neuronal activity. We can predict the seemingly elusive functions of the mind and the choosing via quantum mechanics. I'm not going to get much into quantum mechanics. Alan, our President, our leader, could do that. Well, Brian's our president. But Brian, you can do that better than I can. But Dr. Leaf believes that at the quantum level, we're being changed, not just at the DNA level. And her uh, research bears that out, and the research of others. So we have forests of thoughts in our brains. This totally intrigued me. The picture of our actual thoughts in the mind, that's a Golgi stain. And those are thoughts. Thoughts are things. Thoughts are made of matter. 
we create, break them down, and the breeze blows through them. Check this out. Signals from outside pass through the thalamus, insula, and basal ganglia, circuits and columns inside the brain. They flavor and enrich and distribute the information all along the way. There are so many complex processes going on. I mean, to think that this emerged out of chance, I, I don't have enough faith for that. The movement of thoughts, existing memories, linked to incoming info, information somehow goes from the non-conscious metacognitive level, where, according to Leaf, 90 to 99 percent of our thinking happens. I didn't know that. It goes to the conscious level, and this is where we can actually do something consciously with it. So new incoming info activates four to seven trees. So even right now, as you're hearing this and looking at it, there's some breeze blowing through your mental trees. Pretty interesting. Um, there's another thing that's hot out there, and that's fasting. Anybody heard of intermittent fasting? Trying to eat all you eat in less time and then rest for the rest of the day, 24-hour cycle. It's very healthy. So this, there's a whole lot out there on this. I just wanted to bring it up because this is an ancient practice. Uh, Jewish, Christians, other faiths practice this, people of no faith. But it happens to be something that Christians do. What about mindfulness and meditation? Now this could look like something, uh-oh, we're getting into new age for Christians. We're, you know, you might have your flags come up. Oh, that's that mystical stuff. I prefer mine to be fact and evidence based. Well, stay tuned. This is not just the purview of pra and practice of Eastern religion, but they do it and they benefit from it. Okay, so the, that's a blank screen. But let me read this to you. By charting new pathways in the brain, mindfulness can change the banter inside our heads from chaotic to calm. So we're talking about anxiety tonight. You can set down the chatter, shut that down, order it, and tell it what to do. We'll talk more about the ways to do that. Practicing mindfulness is nothing like taking a pill or another fix that acts quickly, entering into our bloodstream, crossing the blood-brain barrier, if needed, in order to produce an immediate sensation or to dull one. That's from mindful.org. I don't know their spiritual religious commitments, but I do know they have some truth, and all truth is God's truth. Well, instant defense is raised, but let's keep an open mind for something that the Bible doesn't forbid, and if there is evidence for it, let's take a good look at it. We have self-control over our self-talk. We can manage our minds, and in fact, it's contingent on that as to our happiness level or anxiety or our depression. The Center for Healthy Minds in University of Wisconsin said you can train your brain to change. That change is measurable and there are new ways of thinking can change it for the better. So this is not just coming from Dr. Leaf who's on some Christian TV stations who happens to be a cognitive researcher who claims the faith. This is resounding throughout the culture. So another brain change that happens when we meditate, not on medication, but on meditation, the gray matter of the cortical thickness thickens. Uh, this gets into stuff that is definitely not my area, but I just wanted to point it out real quick. The self-regulatory processes like monitoring attention conflicts and making you flexible as you cognate or think that's what this area of the brain does. And if it thickens, it's a lot like muscles or like when people kick you in karate and your bones get thicker so you can take it next time a lot better. This is like working out your brain. The prefrontal context, cortex, executive functioning, planning, problem solving, emotional regulation, schoolwork, labs, studying, papers. And up here, monitoring, monitoring attention conflicts, Things, people knocking on your door. The hippocampus oversees learning and memory. It's very susceptible 
to the problems of stress and depression. But it, it thickens as you meditate. Decreased amygdala size, so that's the fight or flight center. This is the amalgamation, it's the midbrain part where a bunch of stuff comes together and does a bunch of processing. So this is where the anxious emotions live. Notice that it gets smaller as you meditate. So if you're trying to cure anxiety, maybe some meditation on some maybe biblical stuff, some positive stuff, some good imagery, some soft music, maybe that's a great idea. You have less fear after mild mindfulness practices. Again, from mindful.org. So, um, Moreland makes a good case for contemplative prayer in here, and that's a Christian, an ancient Christian practice that I can't get into, but I have uh, begun to discover it myself, and I've had some blowback from a few Christians who say, well, it's not in there. And logically, a lot of things aren't in there, per se, meaning in the Bible. But there are many reasons to think that this is a biblical thing and not really, mostly it's not an unbiblical thing. So the, they're found throughout Christian history, some of the godliest people that have written some of the most impressive things uh, have practiced it. The scripture, it's scripture saturated and prayerful, but anyone can practice such a thing. So again, meditation is something that you can take advantage of, no, wonder your, no matter your faith commitment, okay? But you have so much of a leg up if you have scripture and if you have God there. So what about um, this stuff about the heart? Remember I said something about the heart and mind was mentioned in a scripture? Hmm. As a man thinks, so he is in his heart. Hmm. Well, um, Moreland is a philosopher who makes it clear that his view of the soul is a person. That's us. We're an embodied soul, okay? And so you don't become less of a person if you cut off your arm, okay? And when we die, the shell of our body stays here, but our person goes on. Uh, faculties of the soul, intellect, brain, tied to the brain, intuitive perception, tied to the heart, very important. They work together to form thoughts, emotions, moods, attitudes. Well, stress is a, a malady of, of our modern times, and it has unremitting and increasing levels of stress in our time. Okay, so a Harvard study, I mentioned Harvard already, but they were studying something that has to do with them. People who live in a state of high anxiety are four and a half times more likely to suffer a cardiac death than those who are not living that kind of life. So what is going on here? Doc Childer and his colleague Deborah Rosman, researchers, they've done some research on the heart organ. And this is a very important thing to get a hold of and it's kind of new, it blew my mind. And I had some flags going up when I read this. Oh, wait a minute, what? Huh? In an international investigation, people unable to manage stress were 40% more likely to die. Okay, so that's the bad news. Well, what is this heart stuff and this heart math solution that these researchers came up with? Well, let's talk about the heart and the mind together. Stress is a mental, emotional, and then physical default affects perceptions and feelings, thoughts and beliefs, and our reactions to the world and to ideas. Yeah, so we bring it in with us as well as it coming into us. The holistic applicability of heart math tools is just what a Christian would expect given the centrality of heart of the heart in scripture. Hmm. Wonder if the ancients knew a bit more than we think they did before the scientific revolution. As a center of emotional, intellectual, and volitional faculties along with the moral and the spiritual, it is the deep and most hidden part of us. The heart in biblical terms is all this stuff together the human being on a deeper level, is what Moreland is saying. So the spiritual and the soulish aspect, the intuitive perception, the way of sensing right and wrong, is that the conscience? I'm not sure. Spiritual perception, what's going on in the spiritual realm? Emotional awareness of others, emotional IQ, IQ is a very important and famous book. 
What does all this have to do with? These are notions of the heart that we're talking about here. Interestingly, Paul at Ephesians said, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And spiritual disciplines focus on awareness and centering, and that, that can be a, a, a yellow flag word at least for people. But when you have your soul being centered, that's what it seems to be talking about, say in Romans 12. You know, be conformed to this world, but be renewed by the transforming, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay. So emotions and other non other conscious states reside in certain organs. See, that's that's the whole thing that was really weird for me. Okay, so what you've got here is a claim that you've got stuff going on in certain places in your body. Well, why not? Because we're bodily creatures, both spiritual, soulish, intellectual, and bodily creatures. So stuff being headquartered somewhere in your body that bothers you or is toxic for you just makes sense. Just like poisoning seems to go to certain organs. So maybe the heart really does know. I gave this, my wife this card. My heart, when my heart found you, it knew. Well, maybe there's more to that than just a good little sentiment for me and my wife privately. What if it's true? So children Rosman's research talks about the heart brain and the head brain connection. More signals from the heart than the head sends back. There's an intuitive information passage way going back and forth. In fact, the facts about it are incredible. I'll give you some numbers here in a minute. The body, primarily the heart, exhibits intuitive emotional perception not always registered in our heads. You ever had something happen and you didn't really think about it, but you knew it? Well, there's two major aspects of the heart regarding anxiety. Heart rhythms, critical neck connections to emotional states. Anxiety, if they do the, the uh, scans, they see jagged emotions. Actually, this is from ECGs, electrocardiograms. Jagged breathing. So you've got an electromagnetic field and measured 10 feet around a person. You know, you can tell how people are doing, can't you? And you can see people avoiding others people with that capability at least. That's the normal. You can tell what's going on with people and you can see people either drawn to folks or avoiding folks. You either give off fumes that you're angry or people want to be around you and people go to you. That's what's going on with the heart. Electrocardiograms measure these heart rhythms that are happening. Emotionally distressed peoples are incoherent. They're all over the place. Hmm, interesting. Learning how to regulate them, get them back in a steady, healthy rhythm is a goal. And that would be true even if you didn't have any kind of an ethical or religious reason to do it, right? Just for your health, right? So the implications of the heart brain would be the heart has its own nervous system and it really can know. It's many times more powerful and it has a much higher amplitude than the mind, than the, than the brain. It can be presented to God as something from our humanity to be an instrument of well-being. Be anxious for nothing and fear not are not empty words. They're not just something from the Bible that might be true or might not. Since scripture got here first, the Bible as a knowledge tradition might also be something that you look at a second time. You know, maybe if it's talking about what you couldn't have known back then through science, because science, modern science didn't exist. Hmm, something to think about. Skepticism doesn't always have to be a default. Okay, so I mentioned a tool to help you with the anxiety of trying to figure everything out. We did, um, I did a talk on world views, switching gears here. So we've talked about the heart, and I know I've, I, see some, I see some faces here. You're giving me fumes like, oh, I don't know about that stuff. I didn't either. But I do know my earthly experience. I do know that artists and poets and the scripture and others have known these things. But I also know that it didn't used to be the way it is now on all that heart stuff. People didn't always just back off of that. We are modernists. We believe that we know things through the rational faculty 
And a lot of times we downplay or even dismiss or deny what's going on with the heart. But science is kind of helping us get to a different view or back to an original view. But one thing, changing gears, that I found out here at school is that a lot of students believe that we have to figure everything out, lock, stock, and barrel, every bit of it. And that pressure's on us, and that's just too much pressure, isn't it? Because people for millennia have been debating these issues. What issues? Worldview issues. The big questions of life. So there's an epistemic crisis for a lot of people. Well, let me speak to that. Now, Leaf makes a, again, I'm not a quantum physics nut, and I don't know much about it, but she says quantum physics and neuroscience, for that matter, her field, do not provide ultimate answers. They are simply stepping stones in the development of our understanding of our almighty God, another way of admiring God. So again, she's taking it such that it's something we can say, ah, oh, is that how God did it? which is originally what science was all about. Well, this is a very important quote that I'd like to read at length because it gets to the reason that reasonable faith is here. We want to get to the ideas underneath everything. There are pervasive, subtle, almost subconscious patterns of ideas in our culture that imply there's no meaning to life. And that may explain a lot of the unease and the anxiety, right? The depression. If we don't know why we're here, or that anything matters, then why are we even doing what we're doing? All that's left is addiction to happiness, instant gratification, literal plague of deep anxiety affecting millions. As it turns out, our beliefs are the rails in which our lives run. We almost always live up or down to our actual beliefs. Hmm, interesting statement. Our worldview, <coughs> the set of things that we actually believe about God, reality, meaning, value, what counts as success, what constitutes a good person, and whether or not we are one, what we can and cannot know, and other significant topics is the most important factor of our life. It's more important than having a flat stomach, being healthy, or fulfilling the American dream. Or passing that exam. I want to introduce you to something we promised in the promo, a tool. And you know what, to save time, I'm not gonna go out of the presentation and zoom in like I was going to. I don't know if you can see it. But this is a real useful tool. People of faith and people outside the faith and people fighting the faith have actually used it. One professor at a uh, institution in Georgia used it to talk kids out of their faith, which was her goal in class. After five semesters, she realized, oh my gosh, I think I need to rethink what type I am here and she believed in Jesus Christ and became a Christian. Now, this isn't an evangelistic tool. It's just that she was thinking things through. This is very helpful. Um, type one takes as a core assumption about what is really real, that there's only something physical. What is that called? Naturalism, Naturalism materialism. Type two says only what is non-physical is real. So it's the opposite. Okay, what? Hmm. Now, who would that fall under? What, Maybe. Plato. What's that? Plato. Plato? <laughs> Maybe that would be people in uh, pantheistic religions. Okay? New Age, Hinduism, things like that. But we pick those things up too. You don't have to have a, an ism attached to your name or be a person of a certain faith. Um, to a type three person, Two things are real, the creator and his creation. So these are the big picture questions up here. And these are the people questions down here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Where does everything come from? Physical universe made itself. Reality is only perception. God made them. How does everything work? Natural laws operate the universe. That's all there is. It is a process that evolves towards conformity with a perceived perfection. Does that sound familiar when you... I have an Eastern religion or something like that. But a lot of people live as if that's true, whether they think they're Eastern or not. And for a type three person, God runs creation with natural laws which reflect his character. Well, what is a human being? Let's talk about the people questions, because we're talking about anxiety and a lot of psychology and spirituality here. What is a human being? A highly evolved animal 
or a being evolving as an expression of the mental, mental or spiritual perfection. A human is physical, mental, and a spiritual creation is the third type. Now this is from a book called Transparent, How to See Through the Powerful Assumptions That Control You. And I can put, post that on our Facebook page. It is also in the PowerPoint, which we'll make available. So what is good? You remember we were talking about the worldviews, and part of that that gives us anxiety is what does it mean to be good, and am I good? And who says? And does that get counted for me if I'm good or not? Well, what is good? Well, to a type one, what I or we decide? Social or individual decisions about what is good. But to the type two person, what will make the world better? It's kind of a um, pragmatist for everyone kind of a position. Type three people, God reveals it. We have to be told from the outside what's good and who's good and how to be good. Well, what is humanity's basic problem is kind of the final big question that this tool answers. Well, and looky here. Notice the trend on the x-axis. Where do we look for answers? Inside the self or the system or the universe? In other words, we decide. We're talking a lot about free will here. Or outside the universe, God decides. He says. Hmm. So what is humanity's basic problem? Well, for that type person, religious ignorance. Physical only reality, ignorance of these things. And that's why a professor would think that they have a moral obligation for talking people out of their parents' faith or out of their faith. Uh, they're, as we've discussed here, where their grounding is for morality, that decision is yet to be seen. But they feel that way. Well, to the type two, inequality or ignorance is the ideal. Sounds like, like a lot of what we hear in the headlines and in marches today. Um, I love the brevity of this one for a type three person. Humanity's basic problem is that people are not good. So these determine where you come from from underneath. These are the internal, unreflected, often, things that we believe. Now, what we're learning about brain science that comports with scripture is that we can take these things, we can notice them, we can name them, and we can bring them out to the light of day, and we can say, are they true or not? Hopefully this tool will help you. So what we're talking about through spiritual means, especially, is a life without lack. Is that even possible? So it's beyond life hacks. It's beyond getting peace this semester or today, or regularly for the things in this life. It goes beyond. Is there really such a thing? Well, there was a philosophy professor at the University of South Southern California, Dallas Willard. Many of you have heard of him. It was, this was compiled posthumously after he died. Life without lack, living in the fullness of Psalm 23. Highly recommended. But it's very, very Christian. And so if you don't hew to a Christian faith or if you're new at it or if you're wondering about it, it's something to check into. If you are a Christian, it's very, very helpful. So what is being said about the happiness factor in science, okay? Um, I can't pronounce her name, but this researcher wrote The How of Happiness, said it's determined happiness is determined 50% by inherited biological set points. You're just born happy or not. 10% by life circumstances. So she's saying that it's not the stuff that happens to us that really changes us and determines our happiness. 40% is intentional free choices. Hmm. So again, free will. You have it in your power to begin a re regimen of choices, assuming you would choose the right things and form a habit of this that can substantially improve your happiness and decrease or get rid of anxiety. There really is hope, according to Moreland. Well, what about this inalienable right for Americans and I believe all others? Okay, so that's part of the Declaration of Independence and it's ontologically true, I believe, for everyone that it's an inalienable right from God. But everybody wants it, don't they? Don't we all go for happiness? So God's okay with that, y'all. He's not just a killjoy. He doesn't just give commands from the mountaintop. Okay. 
Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. How realistic can you get? Happiness defined. Well, can't go into it. There's a wonderful article at probe.org, my organization, by a colleague. And he goes into the different ancient views, the pluses and the minuses. And you know what? These guys were onto something. Epicurus believed it's the virtuous person living at peace with his neighbors who generally has far less cause to fear and worry that, than someone who's up to no good. Yeah, such a person is more likely to experience true joys like friendship, mental tranquility, than his non-virtuous counterpart. Okay, so far so good. Stoics, according to scholar Ellen Chari, they viewed the goal of life as human flourishing. This was understood, however, not in terms of having a long life or a lot of money. Rather, it was viewed as, quote, maintaining one's dignity and grace whatever may happen. Hmm, that's commendable. For a biblical Christian, sure. The Stoics understood that things didn't always work out as we want. Life throws us many curveballs, and if we're not prepared, we're bound to be disappointed. Their solution? In a statement reminiscent of the Buddha's teaching, the Stoic Epictetus declared, demand not what events happen, that events not happen as you wish, but wish them to happen as they do happen, and you will go on well. Hmm. So it's a little bit of a deterministic, uh, whatever happens, happens, okay, sera, sera. But hope that it'll go well. Neoplatonism, a guy named Plotinus, said since everything, including mankind, emanates out of the one, human beings can only truly find happiness by reala realizing their oneness with the one. Now, where would he be? What type would he be? Type two. Type two. Out of the one, out of perfection. Everything else is illusion. Okay? But he wouldn't necessarily be exactly a pantheist. That's a technical point. Okay, so you've got this guy who basically says happiness resides in a person's realization that she is one with the, the divinity. Okay, one with God. We all want oneness with the best we can have, right? So what Christian has spoken to that? Well, how about Augustine, Augustine? He is probably the most well-known ancient uh, Christian philosopher, probably one of the most influential theologians of all time. Okay, so he defined happiness as knowing and loving God securely. What we really want is the best there is forever. And if you're dead, that can't last, right? So if you're a type one or two, well, if you're a type one, that's not an option. But we all kind of want that, it seems. Since God is the greatest good and what we all search for, whether we're aware of it or not, it's God, the greatest good. God is love. God is justice. The thing we call God generally is what we seem to be after, whether we know it or not. That's the free gift of Jesus Christ. That's what Boyun was testifying about. That's what I can tell you about many people in the room. He's goodness himself, and he's there for us. A life without lack living in the fullness of the 23rd Psalm. Everybody knows some part of the 23rd Psalm. It's in every uh, foxhole movie you ever saw, right? Every war movie. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Joy in his presence is available. Eternal pleasures are at his right hand. Taste and see. Make a choice. Try it out. Do your own field research. What if it's true? What about non-believers in other religions? For some people, well, let's just look at the Anxiety and Phobia Workbook, which gives us a perspective that's seemingly more objective to many people. For some people, a lack of purpose and meaning in life can provide fertile ground for the development of panic attacks and phobias. Not only may spirituality provide life with greater meaning, but it can help overcome anxiety directly because it leads to qualities such as inner peace, serenity, faith, and unconditional love. Well, Buddhism, Hindu, and New Age meditation and other practices have their benefits. But back to Augustine, what about the afterlife? Eternal happiness, even lasting lifelong life without lack. John 10.10, 10, a king that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And Psalm 23 is mentioned. Well, what about Psalm 23? I mentioned uh, Dallas Willard, 
Three conditions are required for that kind of wisdom, power, and love of God. Faith, death to self. He who comes after me must die to himself, said Jesus. And agape, or unconditional love. That seems like a high mark, doesn't it? Unconditional love? Huh. Well, maybe that's a love that only God knows. You know that popular song, God Only Knows? Maybe God only knows how, and maybe he's the only one who can provide it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I have everything I need. I'll fear not. I won't be anxious. For you are with me. Very much a theme through scripture. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Now that's a positive mental attitude. But it's not just somebody seemingly drumming it up. Dallas Willard says, fear and worthy or fear and worry are worthless, indeed even vain emotions. If you're frightened or afraid, there is no use feeling guilty about it. What you need to do is fix your mind upon God and ask him to fill your mind with himself. And as your mind is transformed, your whole personality will be transformed, including your body and your feelings. Is this resonating from what science was telling us and can tell us more of? The transformation of the self away from a life of fear and insufficiency takes place as we fix our mind on God as he truly is. Reasonable faith exists to help you understand what's really going on so that you can look at your underneath beliefs and assumptions and say, wait a minute, is that really true? Maybe I should entertain an alternative notion. Well, our thoughts are real things that come about uh, through protein synthesis. They sit there in our brains, they're tied to our hearts, they're located in our bodies, in different places. Our feelings are part, our emotions are part of our thoughts. These are memories, okay? So we start seeing scripture coming along and comporting with this. Hope is a choice to do this in a positive and normal direction, to, to change our thoughts. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith is not a leap into the dark abyss. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. There's a plethora of evidence. There's warranted belief based on reasons that are given. There's testimony. There's things like the science of it. We've talked endlessly here about reasons to believe. That's why we exist as a club. So Proverbs 31, I mean 23, 7 says, For as a man thinketh, thinketh in his heart, so is he. I stumble over the King James there. Could be translated, For as a man thinks in the core of his mind, so he is. Note the context of the proverb is a seemingly unrelated thing about taking a rich guy's food, but sometimes you get these nuggets stuck right there in a very real life situation. But the peace of Christ, this is the amplified version, the inner calm of one who walks daily with God, be the controlling factor in your hearts, deciding and settling questions that arise. Hey, what about those big questions on the chart? What about whether to go to lunch or not? What about loving somebody back who hurt you? To this peace, indeed, you were called as members in one body of believers. And be thankful to God always. There's that thankfulness thing. The habit of mindfulness works best with God as the focus. The impact that mindfulness exerts on our brain is born from routine. So there's another thing that you can count on. Everything that we're talking about takes practice, practice, practice. Just like playing the piano, learning how to hit a baseball, or learning your stuff in school. You, God, keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Hmm, it's an interesting promise. It's very bold. It's not wishful thinking. If Jesus is the good shepherd, we shall not want, and we will have peace. So the proteins you create, as you hear me and read this, are copied through genetic expression, making memories. The DNA instructions dictate the anatomy of our bodies, and we control up to 90% of this process through our thinking. We are thinking beings. You are brilliant people. Even if you have handicaps, we are brilliant. And we can use that 
and it changes our destinies, basically, because we can decide whether or not God, whether or not happiness and peace, we can decide whether or not we're going to live positively or negatively. AIDS patients believed that if God loves me, they were three times healthier. They had three times less, um, what is it called? The uh, load, viral load. And it wasn't just God's love, but he God, God's love, God loves me. Not God so loved the world, but God loves me. That's when it really made a difference. There's a myth that there's a gene for every addiction in human behavior. The gene for this and the gene for that. And headline writers love that stuff. It's not true. So, as Leaf says, we're not victims of our biology. We're co-creators with God. And our destiny is alongside God. We were given, the narrative says, in the garden, a job to be co-creators, co-laborers, stewards. And we get to do that with our own selves. So let me skip on here and get to some practical things. Has anybody seen any uh, stuff about Thanksgiving? There's been a lot of, uh, I don't mean the holiday. I mean about giving thanks and gratitude. Has anybody seen the science on that? It's really kind of a big thing, okay? And well, it should be because it works. Even for those who aren't, aren't thinking God, just a thankful attitude of gratitude is really helpful. It has one of the strongest links to mental health and satisfaction with life of any personality trait, more than even optimism or hope or compassion. Or compassion. So if you're optimistic, being thankful is even better for your health. Interesting stuff. Grateful people experience higher levels of positive emotions like joy, enthusiasm, love, happiness, and optimism. And gratitude as a discipline protects us from envy, resentment, greed, and bitterness. Hmm. It's kind of hard to be greedy about somebody else's stuff when you're thankful for your own. It's less hard anyway. Well, less easy, I should say. But it requires me to acknowledge I received a good gift, gift is valuable, and it came from outside. I was given it by someone. I didn't self-create and self-actualize everything in my life. Or it doesn't really work. So dozens of studies have shown all these kinds of benefits. It's the opposite of depression, really. Generosity and healthfulness. Better coping with stress. Improved cardiac health. I don't know what vagal tone is, but hey. Greater sense of purpose and resilience. A lot of people are kind of floating through life. What is it for? What am I going to do? Being thankful helps. Self-worth and self-confidence. On and on it goes. But life is tough. Nobody's denying that. And the scripture doesn't deny that. It's very, very realistic. Obstacles, obstacles to gratitude are listed here. The victim mentality, history. Sometimes a history of suffering trauma has to be worked through terribly hard. Uh, and those things can be driven down so deep that they're inaccessible. But there are ways to get at them. And sometimes we need help. Moreland makes a good case that sometimes our brains need a uh, kickstart uh, with medications. Now, sometimes that's controversial in the Christian community. I know I myself have benefited, although I had to cut off some of them because I wanted my highs and lows rather than just having, mm, but that was me that time. So he makes a good case. I recommend that for that alone for the book. Um, so these are the kinds of things, comparison games, nagging out that uh, life can throw at you and we can respond with. And yep, uh, the Bible beats science to it again. We get the impression we were wired to give thanks, created to give thanks, didn't need psych studies, but now we have them. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. So this is real appropriate for next week, Thanksgiving holiday. So uh, maybe you can practice some more of this. On and on. And everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. There's that insertion. It probably doesn't work for you to just think about good things unless you're thankful. In fact, I know it doesn't because I've done that and it's kind of like trying to work a formula for, you know, to get God to help you. But if I'm not thankful for what he has done, it doesn't help. Not really. 
So forming a new habit requires doing things you don't want to do. Any coach will tell you that, right? Run your win sprints so you can win the game and you won't peter out at the end. I love this quote, practice doesn't make perfect, it make, practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. And that goes right along with what we're learning about the brain. So what are some things that we can do? Well, uh, the four-step solution is something that Moreland brings up. And quite simply, and it seems so simple, it's like, well, I'm not sure that's going to help and work very much. You do four things. Relabeling, so connection with reality. Just realize what's going on here. It's, you're a deceptive thought. It really helps to, uh, I've been teaching a friend over here, talk to your thoughts. They're things. You control them. Tell them what to do. Tell them what they are. And then deal with them. So you've got deceptive, destructive, bogus thoughts. Tell them what they are. And then reframing says, take the power out of it. Take the juice out of that thing. Reset your perception by me being mindful that it's going on. Like right now, what are you doing? Are you thinking, I don't know. I'm going to be doing some other stuff, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to X. Or I don't have what it takes. I don't think I'll talk to anybody after the meeting. Or, hey, I think I'll go talk to them and find out what's in the book, or I'll, I'll go conquer something tomorrow. You know, think about your thinking. Get a hold of the thoughts. Do something with them and relabel them. If they're overgeneralizing, oh, I always do that, call it out. If it's discounting the positive, somebody says, oh, you know, good job on that paper. Nah, that sucked. Maybe you're just saying that. Don't do that. Catch yourself doing that. So what's the next step? The four-step solution. Refocus. Set your mind on anything else. Distract yourself. Get away from those thoughts. Don't ruminate over and over on them. The key is not to get stuck in the cycle. Down the tubes. Don't be playing with that poo. Whoa. And so the next step, revaluing. The last one. After a safe amount of time, go back and see what you learned, what you can learn from it. What did you do well? How would you mess up? And then try it again. Take another thought. Take the same thought. Redo it. You're retraining your brain. Um, this is back to the heart level stuff that Moreland was talking about. And again, admittedly, it's kind of mysterious. It's kind of weird. But if we really do have a heart brain, and it has its own nervous system, by the way, research has shown, then there's stuff to be done with it, too. And the heart can know things that the brain sometimes doesn't know. And the heart sends powerful messages, much more powerful in amplitude and, and actual power than the brain. So some things, as I mentioned, are too hard and deep and traumatized to get at frontally. In fact, none of this works so much frontally. But some things have to be gone and gotten and dug up. And you may need help. I highly recommend getting help, therapy. Um, I'm going to give you some resources at the end. But it's, it's a spiritual process based on the Bible, based on new research about the heart-brain dynamic, and based on the arguable belief that physical thoughts and feelings, the poo, reside in your body somewhere. So tonight, you notice I have the voice, the frog voice. And I noticed that I wasn't really breathing that well. I don't know, is anybody else going through the allergy problem right now? Yeah. So I put my hands on my lungs, and I actually, this sounds so weird, I actually pictured a mountain peak climb that I did in the clean air at a recent time on Table Rock in North Carolina. So I did the Rockies and the Appalachians. And you know what? I asked God to help, and it helped and ended up doing the practical stuff kind of without thinking about it, I sat up and tried to regulate the regularity of my breathing. Okay, So one could argue, well, you just regulated your breathing physically. Okay, fine. But it worked. And it gave me peace. So I think it went beyond the physical. So really you can see that there's a lot going on here, but if you freeze frame the thoughts that are hard to get at, you're ceasing to strive like God asked us to. If you shift the focus from the racing, can, you ever had something that just 
get a hold of you and can't get rid of it? Trust in the Lord. And you can do that in your heart. Okay? That's not just a mental exercise. That's not just something for the private sphere. That's something that you're doing. Wait for the emotion. Okay? So there's an acrostic compassion, care, forgiveness, appreciation, non judgmentalism. I know this is sounding kind of woo to some of you, but the goal is to bring a new positive emotion, not to think about the old toxic thoughts that are tied to emotion. Remember, thoughts are emotions with thoughts. Memories are thoughts plus emotions. Okay? So I hear people, uh, especially in these circles, say, oh, yeah, that's emotional thinking. Well, your thoughts are emotional. That's how it works. That's how the science of it works. Okay? And then melt the anxious thought. While holding the good memory, take apart the anxious thought. I held on to the clean air at altitude in the Rockies. And I let go the fear that I wasn't going to be able to talk and that my breathing problems were going to keep me from good sleep because I have sleep apnea. These are real issues. They're deep. I have real fears based on that. Is it ruining my life not to sleep as well as I could? Well, it very well may be. And my response to that is up to me. And I might be able to help myself physically. Now, we're at the end of our time. I wish I had jumped over to this because this is the real juicy stuff, okay? Switch on Your Brain is a really interesting book. This lady is from Dallas. Dr. Leaf is speaking at the Anatole or one of the big hotels. December 6th, I believe it is. You can look her up, drleaf.com. But let me go there for just a sprint through, okay? Would that be all right? Okay? Because it ties together so much of the science. And you may have questions at the very end. Sorry if I took too long. But uh, it, the 21 day brain detox plan is based on the fact that it does take at least 21 days to change things. And when we have memories and thoughts that are not dealt with, they rot, basically. So you have to strengthen them, or you can tear down other ones. Hopefully you're doing both. You're doing the tear down and the build up, like Ecclesiastes talks about. So it's a rigorous, disciplined daily routine that becomes a lifestyle of renewing your mind. It's a lifestyle of neuroplastically rewiring your nerve networks. It's driven by you and hopefully led by the Holy Spirit. It gets you in the state of deep intellectual introspection and self-reflection. So you can do this as a non-Christian. You can do this as an atheist. So, gathering the first step. What are the thoughts bubbling up into your mind now? This is what's happening in the brain. Remember that complicated thing I showed you here? You wouldn't believe the document that she's got. It is just incredible. Sensory information flows in through the five senses. Existing memories go from the non-conscious to the conscious. Attitudes are invoked as it moves through the different brain parts. The hypothalamus responds to the attitude chemically. Again, when you're responding to someone about their position, you might be having a bodily response in your gut, in your brain, that you don't even know you're having. The amygdala is activated to recall linked emotions, perceptions. All this info enters the hippocampus and embeds. All this electromagnetic, chemical, quantum physics stuff is happening in the front of the brain. So the second step is focused reflection. Focused thinking, disciplined, attention regulation, controlling rage. Does anybody have an anger problem? On 75 Central as you drive down? Yeah. Confession time. Body awareness, emotion regulation. The fruit of the spirit is self-control. So that's the goal here. Focused reflection. So Christians have things called a quiet time. Okay? Others have just reading time or sitting on a bench in a park. So all these kinds of things can help you. The neuroplasticity is dominant now fixes the brain for redesign. So the goal again is to take things and restructure them. We can take thoughts, bring them out from the deep recesses or from the front of our mind, wherever they are, 
and we can attach new emotions to them and we can give ourselves the kind of non-anxious, peaceful way of being that God promises. How? Hopefully through his power that you can use these principles yourself no matter your commitment there. So I'm not recommending you do it without God. I'm just saying that it doesn't apply only to Christians because this is what Christians call common grace. This is the way God designed it. It's like the third one is to write. Does anybody journal in here? Raise your hands if you do. Do you ever journal or keep a, you know, diary? Or do you write all the time? This is the kind of thing that helps your brain to put it all together. It goes into the basal ganglia. The interconnectivity of the brain and writing is marvelous. It gets all of it into use. Memories, thoughts, planning, understanding, emotions. When you write, you're putting it all together. And I need to do that much more. My daughter keeps countless journals and documents detailing her thoughts and feelings. And I believe that's how she really gets over what I believe to be a, de a detachment disorder. It's really hard for her to connect with people. But she connects when she sends us a song or writes a poem or buys me a journal because that's what she does. So she's not just compensating, she's working through it. And so the fourth step is to revisit. And this is moving forward to solutions. Reactions, toxicity levels are taken care of. It's retranscribing the brain. The heart acts as the checking station. This is revisiting the process. I'll let her go into it when you get her book. And then the last step is the active reach. This is putting this stuff into practice. It destroys the now unglued thought tree branches. Okay, so you've got tree branches. Remember the Golgi stain, the thing that looked like a plant? So you're ungluing toxic thoughts. You're putting them in the chipper. You know, you've seen somebody put trim trees and then put that noisy thing at the back of the trailer. It takes a log and turns it into sawdust. That's what you're doing with toxic thoughts when you deal with them this way. And then you're gluing <coughs> the good stuff to those thoughts, those memories. There's a saying in brain science, what wires together, what fires together, wires together. So what you think of a lot really is determining what happens here. So set your mind on the things that are good. Philippians 4.8, if anything good, a good repute. Think on these things. So that at this stage you can have the happy chemicals come along. Dopamine and serotonin, motivation and focus and feeling good. And then you feel the truth, which can activate your faith, whatever your faith happens to be in. So I recommend the 21-day method. The thing that's hard for me, I've already tried to use some of these, is to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And some of these things you do many times a day. Okay, but what you're doing is taking your thoughts captive. You know, um, what does it say in first, 2 Corinthians 10, 5? We take these thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, tearing down the thoughts that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God. Does God really care about me? We're not just talking about societal isms. We're talking about whether he really has a claim on me, whether I believe it or not. And every thought that raises itself up against the knowledge of God, we can tear down and bring it into captivity to him. So whether you're exploring Jesus Christ, faith in him, whether you're a faithful Christian, whether you're a struggling Christian, whether you're a tried and true atheist, whatever the case, these are the things that the deeper Christian life promises and the scripture promises. Science is coming along and it's very uncanny how things are coming together with this. I don't know if I've made that case fully, but I thought I'd raise the issue. There are a bunch of takeaways. We don't have time for them, but I'd love to give you this PowerPoint presentation. <coughs> and next time, I'm gonna have a better voice. I'm gonna work on it. Thank you for your attention.